Hey everybody, this is Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff, and I went out and got myself an iPhone 6 now so that I can compare it to the iPhone 6 Plus. And what I can say so far, now that I have finally had a chance to play with the iPhone 6, is that it's very hard to decide between the two. I really kind of have been going back and forth in the battle. Which one do I want to keep? Because I'm not going to keep both of these. I actually did buy both of these and one of these is going to go back to the store. So what I want to do is do a little bit of a comparisons between what I'm noticing for these two. Maybe I can help you decide and against the conundrum that I'm having if you should go for the plus or the six. So the first thing that you're going to notice with these devices and probably what's going to help you decide first thing is the size. We've got the iPhone 6 Plus and the iPhone 6 and you can just see that the iPhone 6 Plus dwarfs the iPhone 6. And then you've got the iPhone 5S and the running joke is that the iPhone 5S can comfortably fit within the size of the 6 Plus display. So you can see that sizes are as follows. Now I did do a pocket test of the 6 Plus just because I wanted to have some fun with it and you can see really what it looks like. I know that guys have deeper pockets but there's girls who are probably going to want this phone as well even though our hands are tiny. And in that pocket test you can see just how difficult it is to manage and how much it sticks out of the pocket and that would be because of these bezels. Let's go ahead and take the least worst case scenario on the other side. This is the 5S. Just look at the difference! Look at that! That's just hilarious! When increasing the size of the display, I would have thought that Apple would redesign the phone so that it would work with this size of display. Because it's not really the size that bothers me, honestly. It's the ergonomics of the phone. They're just really not all that good. It really is the iPhone 6 that's just been blown up to epic proportions. And they didn't make any consideration as to what it would be like to just blow this phone up to a larger size. Now, of course, they did include a new concept such as the double tap for reachability, but for people with small hands, it's just kind of a moot point because I still really can't reach it very well. You know, all the way to the side, it still doesn't work. And another thing is when you look at both of these phones, they've kept the button placement in pretty much the exact same place, even though they've made the device a lot longer. So when I'm holding this phone, I want to keep my hand in the middle. That's where it feels the most balanced. That's where it feels the best. But you can see that if I want to have that functionality of this button down at the bottom, I'm going to have to always choke all the way upward to get to these buttons here, and I'm going to have to choke all the way upward to get to the power button. And then I'm going to have to shimmy downward again to get to the home button. So it would have been really nice if they would have moved some of this stuff downward a little bit. You can see indeed everything looks to be in about the same place regardless of size. Whoops. And as for everything else, everything really is in the same place. It truly is just a bigger iPhone 6. If I had to choose one of these devices just by how it feels in hand, I would pick the iPhone 6. The iPhone 6 has that Apple experience that I expect. It feels really nice in the hand. Everything just feels right. So if you're dead set on getting an iPhone 6 Plus and you want to know how to make it feel a little bit better in hand, I would just go for a case. That's what I did, and it has made all the difference. And the point with that being is that not only is this phone slippery, so because it's larger, it's very slippery, I feel like I might drop it, but where I tend to hold it is in the middle. That's where it feels the most balanced. But in order to use things like the home button, I have to choke downward, and then it becomes a bit top-heavy. A lot of the weight feels like it's at the top. So in combination with it being slippery, I feel like I'm going to drop it. So putting it in the case makes just all the difference. And it's made this phone more usable for me. I was completely dead set against using this phone until I put a case on it. And then I was like, okay, yeah, this camera is no longer protruding as well. So it just feels like an oversized phone now, as opposed to a $900 paperweight that I've smashed on the ground. So you can see that I have the silver version here. And we have these lines. These are these plasticky lines. This helps us get antenna signal. And I do agree that they look quite cheap. That's what a lot of people are bothered about. And what bothers me is that they really don't even mesh very well with the phone. If we zoom in there real close, you can see that it's not seamless. And I wouldn't say that there is a gap here, but you can see that they don't exactly lie mesh flat against the device. And that kind of makes it look cheap. The one where it looks the least apparent is going to be on the space gray version but eh, I really don't like it so much. 
On both of them, you've also got that protruding camera lens, although I am pretty sure that it's sapphire glass on both of them, so it should not scratch even though it's protruding. Now when looking at the durability of both of these phones, I do want to mention that according to iFixit Teardowns, which did take apart both of these phones, they got the same design language and the same design overall in terms of build. So when we talk about this thing that everyone has been calling Bendgate, Actually, both of these have the same weak point for bending. Now for me, I have not had any problems whatsoever yet with either of these phones bending. You can see that they look straight. Although I do have to say, when I lie these phones flat, especially my 6, this is not something I noticed when it came out of the box, is that it does rock a little bit, like as if it's warped. Now it's not bent, so I'm not concerned really about that. But these phones are very thin, and they're aluminum, and they don't have a mid-frame. So you can only imagine that with heat and force over time that they could warp. They very well might bend. With other phones, not only do you have the outside body, but you've also got a mid-frame, a piece in the middle, which is usually magnesium alloy. And magnesium is very durable, and it's not going to bend like aluminum will. But unfortunately, Apple doesn't have any type of a mid-frame. Here when looking at the image from iFixit, you can see that it's just the body of the phone and then they put everything inside of this body and then they are relying on the display to be part of the rigidity of the phone. So all you have to make this phone any bit of rigid are these little brackets here. Here we have the bracket at the volume button and the weak point we've been seeing. And then we've got the display assembly which has hooks that are attaching into these brackets that you can see here except for not right here. You do seem to have some type of a reinforcement bracket. It's also keeping these volume buttons in place. Instead of this bracket adding reinforcement, when it bends, actually it's just bending along with where this screw is. So it bends and the screw just twists with it. So that's a little bit unfortunate. Now I can imagine that Apple is not going to say anything about this. It's probably going to cause pandemonium and global upset with the amount of devices that they have sold. So if anything happens, Apple will probably find a way to reinforce these weak points. There's actually a weak point right here as well. And then I can see in several weeks that if you take apart phones, they might not look exactly the same way anymore inside. So we will see what happens. But to talk about Consumer Reports findings and also Apple's findings where they invited some members of the press to see that this is indeed actually pretty durable. The thing is that they only tested it at one fulcrum right there in the middle. And as people understand that a device is as strong as its weakest point. So if this is the weakest point, why did they not test this fulcrum right here? So with this bend gate thing, that's what everyone is doing. They're pushing right at that weak spot. If you push here, you don't have a weak point. You don't have a big empty spot right here where these volume buttons cause a hole in this aluminum. So it is weak already. So I can't say that Consumer Reports and Apple are entirely wrong, but they're also being a little bit short-sighted because this is where the problem is right here. So, so far, no, my phones are not bent. I'm also planning on getting some type of a case, a rigid case that's going to hopefully add some type of reinforcement. I know that Spigen has one that has a bumper that has metal that goes along the sides. I'm hoping that causes some extra reinforcement. So while I'm not entirely freaking out about bend gate, I don't put it out of the question as if my phone could, for some reason, bend. If the right force is applied, it can indeed happen. And both of these should be similarly afflicted. So now I wanted to take a small break to take a second to thank my sponsors over at audible.com so much for making content creation possible and also making it possible to purchase devices for review. If you don't know who Audible is, they are a leading online provider of downloadable audiobooks with over 150,000 titles from every genre I could possibly think of. So I was having a nerd out moment and I was going through all the books to see what I wanted to look at this week and I found this book that is by Randall Monroe. Now you probably have heard of Randall Monroe's famous web comic series, XKCD. Maybe you've heard of it, just maybe. It's incredibly popular and he's hilarious. He's a retired robotics engineer from NASA. And this book is called Serious Scientific Answers to Absurd Hypothetical Questions, What If? And once I saw that this is being read by Will Wheaton, I was sold. I just, I just had to check it out. It's basically like Sheldon Cooper's favorite bedtime stories. There's all these crazy questions that people ask him and he answers them on a scientific basis. So you've got some questions like what happens if a person self-impregnates themselves? What would the child actually be like? 
Or people ask stuff like, how fast can you ride over a speed bump and survive? Or my personal favorite, how much force power does Yoda output? So it's just, there's just some hilarious stuff. It's really great. And there's just so much humor. So if you're interested in checking out this book or any other book and trying an Audible service, please follow audible.com slash Erica. And if for some reason you don't like this book, you are free to exchange it at any time, no questions asked. And also they're an Amazon company, so you can easily sign in with your Amazon information. So again, if you want to check out this book, follow audible.com slash Erica. This is really a good listen. It's really awesome. I'm probably gonna go out and buy the actual book now. This is, this is hilarious. Now, another thing to take a look at to help people decide which one they should go for is do you want a larger display or are you okay with the smaller size? Also, the resolution is higher on the iPhone 6 Plus. You've got 1080p display here and you've got a 750p display here. It's kind of weird what Apple does. Both of these have a 16.9 aspect. So you've got a 5.5 inch display, it's 401 pixels per inch versus your 4.7 inch display, which is 326 pixels per inch. It's the same pixel density as the iPhone 5 and 5S. So if you've had either of these phones, you will know what to expect in terms of resolution on this one. It just simply is bigger. For someone like me who can see even the tiniest minute detail, I tend to like the 1080p display better. Specifically, I noticed that when going outside and taking pictures that this works a lot better for me. I've got a bigger display and a more pixel dense display so I can easily see what I'm looking at. It's got more detail. And this one is a little bit smaller. And there isn't as much detail that I can see on this display. If you're someone who really likes going out and taking pictures, I found that this one was more of a joy to use outside. I can also say that this display gets brighter than this one. So on the media side, and also for taking pictures, it does make quite a big difference. Let's go ahead and hold these up to the camera so that you can see side by side what it looks like in terms of the pixel resolution. When we go real close, this is the 1080p display looking at the photos icon. And then let's go ahead and do the same thing with the iPhone 6. So please go into the Apple Store, play with both of these phones so that you can see for yourself which one looks best for you. Of course, text is going to look sharper on the 1080p display. But there is one thing I do have to say though right now is that this is a 1080p display, but the applications are not taking advantage of that. So what's happening is that you have applications and they're rendering the application at a larger size than what we have on this display. And then they shrink it back downward, they downscale it back to 1080p, and the result is something that looks wonky and kind of fuzzy. So I'm hoping that developers are able to fix that rather quickly. I'm not counting on that. If you don't want to be a beta tester, in theory, this one has a sharper display, but this one might end up looking sharper for now until we have applications that are meant for this larger display. Apps are also scaled on the iPhone 6, but they're not blown up and shrunk like they are with the 1080p display. So right now especially, I find it irritating that in applications like the Chrome browser, that I've got this beautiful 1080p display and everything just looks fuzzy. Everything is scaled. Everything just doesn't look like a premium display. I'm, I'm quite bummed. It certainly doesn't look anywhere near as fuzzy on the iPhone 6. So how about the calibration of these displays? Well, I've done measurements of both of them and I can see that Apple tried to calibrate them very similarly. You do have a brighter display here. This one is brighter, this one's a little bit dimmer, but this one has a bit better contrast ratio. So in terms of blacks, you're getting a little bit better blacks. What I noticed for both of them is that for the claims of them having full sRGB standard, they're both quite bluish. This one's a little bit less bluish. What I mean is that in a white balance of red, green, and blue, you've got too much blue in here. And you can also see that the color temperature is around 7,300 Kelvin. So it certainly is too blue. It should be more neutral looking. And that is something that's been disappointing for me. They claim sRGB and then they have a white point that's just too blue. I noticed that the colors kind of have a bluish cast to them. It is nice though that Apple doesn't do crazy things with oversaturating colors. They leave everything natural the way it should be. So the displays look pretty nice. My one gripe is that they're just a little bit too bluish. Another thing that I want to point out is that the grayscale calibration is good on both of these devices. Now the grayscale calibration is important because if 
crazy things are happening with the grayscale calibration, the image just isn't going to look right. You can have color accuracy, but if you just ruin the grayscale, things just won't look good. So for example, what I see companies doing, especially Android phones, every pretty much every single Android phone that I've seen lately, whether you have HTC, LG, Samsung, they're all doing crazy things with the grayscale, such as boosting, gamma and shadows, which ends up making things look too dark too soon. So you end up losing details and shadows. And also I will see companies make the gamma lower in highlights. So they'll make gamma higher in shadows and lower in highlights. And it will create an artificial looking contrasty effect, trying to make the display pop. But I think that that overall can make some things just look weird and not natural. And then you have Samsung who just takes the gamma and makes it too high overall. And then mess with the colors and oversaturate those as well. So I'm just happy with Apple's methodologies. They do a good job. You should be happy with both of these. Apple did do a similar job on both of them. I can watch movies and I can enjoy that if I watch dark scenes, it looks right. So while I'm not happy that they're kind of bluish, it still is a really great media experience on both of them. Now to talk about battery life, which is going to be something that might really help someone decide, is that if you are looking for good battery life, I would be paying a lot of attention to the iPhone 6 Plus because it's got a near 3000 milliamp hour battery compared to the little bit over 1800 milliamp hour battery right here. So you end up having almost twice the battery size. So for me, it's been about a six hour day because I'm a heavy user. I notice I can get about six hours out of this one versus pretty much a 12 hour day out of this one. I, I feel like I'm getting two times the battery life. I feel that the battery life on the iPhone 6 is very similar to the iPhone 5S and the battery life on the iPhone 5S just didn't really get me through the day too well. I would have to charge it usually two times. If I went overboard, I would get sometimes needing to charge it three times a day. And I've already noticed a similar behavior with this one. So battery life is pretty much the same, if not just a tad bit better than the iPhone 5S. It gets me about through half the day on heavy use. If you're not someone who's a heavy user, I'm sure you can squeeze an entire day out of it no problem. Some people have even told me, yeah, battery life is pretty good. But I'm expecting that to be people who are non-power users. What a power user looks like is someone who works from their mobile device. That would be me. My device is my mobile office. All day long, I am getting tons of emails, text messages. I'm constantly browsing the web. I'm answering questions all day long, plus everything else that I do with my phone, a little bit of gaming, some Netflix. I do keep both displays at a little bit over 50%. The sweet spot for me is usually 60 to 70%. So that just gives you a good idea that if you are a heavy, heavy user, this one is probably going to be the better option for you. If you're someone who's just using your phone for social media and making calls throughout the day, a little bit of gaming, you should be just fine with this one. That's really up to your judgment. I'm sure that a lot of you have had the iPhone 5S before this. So just keep this in mind. Now, before I forget, another tidbit about the recharging times between both of these is that this one can take about three and a half hours to charge. And this one's about two hours. Now, I've seen, of course, you can get yourself an iPad charger. So get yourself an iPad charger and you can charge these much, much quicker. I recommend doing that because this one, seriously, you can calculate it yourself. It can take three and a half hours to charge. Now, how about performance between both of these devices? Right off the bat, I want to say that I noticed that the iPhone 6 is a little bit better of a performer right now. Mind you, I am wondering if we're going to be seeing some differences as we end up having some updates. So just around the interface, around the UI, I find that this one just feels more smooth in hand. I have a couple of examples. One of the most obvious ones that I see is underneath the Safari browser. If you go underneath the tab switcher, take a look at the animation at the top here. You can see that it struggled a little bit Let's go ahead and do the same thing now. So we're gonna hit this tab switcher and it's very smooth. I also see this one stutter a little bit when exiting out of applications. Another place that I see it is underneath the spotlight search. You can see it goes, eh, it struggles. And then we've got the six and it's smoother. Another place that I see it struggle sometimes is when I turn it to the side, it struggles a little bit. The animation doesn't end up being entirely smooth. Whereas for the iPhone 6, when I turn it to the side, the animations are nice and fluid. 
I do want to say, though, that counter to what I am seeing with what's going on with the interface is that with benchmark applications, these ones actually do pretty much on par the same. Interestingly, when I'm doing some benchmarks, I see that this one scores just a tad bit higher. Now, when looking at results from GFX benchmark, I ran this over and over and over and over again, and I got pretty much the same results every single time. You can see that the iPhone 6 Plus is a little bit better all across the board than the iPhone 6, and I found that interesting, especially for the on-screen tests, because what I assumed is that not only does this have more pixels to push around, so it could struggle a little bit on that front, but also it's rendering at a higher resolution than 1080p and then also having to downscale it. So I don't know how much resources it uses for that. But then interestingly here, I see that for the on-screen scores that this does a little bit better than the iPhone 6. So you can see that also for T-Rex. So that is not what I expected. And then you can see we've got Geekbench as well. And you can see that for the single core and multi-core that the 6 Plus does a little bit better than the 6. So prior to what I saw with the Nantex scores, where with the GFX benchmark, it seemed that this device seemed to really struggle with a 1080p display and also having to render at a higher resolution than downscale, I don't see it struggling that same way. So my hope here is that even though I'm seeing that the interface has a little bit of issues, that after a couple of updates, that should be sorted and we'll have a nice smooth device. I really can't say. So the last deciding factor that I want to look at is in terms of the camera, really we have the same hardware here. These are both eight megapixel cameras, a little bit better sensor than before. In general, I noticed that they don't have that same bluish cast that taking pictures with the iPhone 5S had and also definitely not as noisy, especially in low lighting. But the only real difference that I see between these is that this has optical image stabilization while this one does not have optical image stabilization. Now I have some video samples and also image samples. On the image sample front, I find them to be so, 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 so similar in terms of color profiling. What I do notice though is that the effects of the optical image stabilization don't kick in until you have some low lighting. And in that case, you do see a little bit less noise than what you see with the iPhone 6, but it is not a huge deal breaker. So what I notice for all of the iPhone 6 Plus photos versus the iPhone 6 photos is that the iPhone 6 Plus has a slower shutter speed and also a lower ISO in all the images that I see. I can only tell the difference though in low lighting, like I've mentioned, and what you can see with low lighting is just ever so slightly less noise and the details look just a tad bit more clear or sharp and really that's it. It's hard to tell without a trained eye at many times that there's any difference whatsoever. I'm going to be including all these photos in a link in the description so you can check them out yourself, blow them up full size. So optical image stabilization is supposed to be better for taking clearer, sharper images, especially in regards to low lighting, as I am saying here. The other thing that optical image stabilization is good for is for stabilizing video. So it helps to get rid of the little vibrations that you can see in video. It helps to reduce the look of footfalls in video. And the interesting thing that I am seeing when I went and did my video stabilization tests is that I can't tell the difference between both of these. I will show some video samples and you can even look for yourself, but I can't tell the difference. It almost feels as if Apple decided to forego the optical image stabilization in favor of using their own software stabilization algorithm. I do want to reach out to Apple to ask them if that is true, but I can look at their website you can see for the EyeSight camera, this is the iPhone 6 Plus and this is the iPhone 6. You can see it says optical image stabilization underneath the EyeSight camera for taking images. But when you go underneath video recording, you can see that it says video stabilization, video stabilization, cinematic video stabilization, cinematic video stabilization. I don't see it saying optical image stabilization here. Now, Apple doesn't exactly say how either of these work and if optical image stabilization is included in any of these, I can't say. The only thing I can do is ask Apple. But in my comparison tests, these look so similar in video that I'm almost comfortable saying that there isn't actually optical image stabilization going on here. Again, I can't say 100% for sure, but really, it's, it's as if it's not there.
So it seems that the only place the optical image stabilization is going to be helpful is in low lighting when taking pictures. I'm hoping to hear more about this, but that's really not a big reason to go for the iPhone 6 Plus then if this feature is not fully capable. So in conclusion, I hope that the things I compared and pointed out will help you decide which one to pick. It comes down to a couple of things. It comes down to size, what you want in a display, and if you need to have a more robust battery. If you like that classic iPhone feel, please go for the iPhone 6. I think that it really feels as Apple as intended it, where this one does feel kind of like an afterthought. And I don't think that they put much thought into the one-handed usability of this phone, both with where they've placed the volume buttons and some things with the interface. It's nice that they do have that reachability feature, but it's not going to be the best thing for everyone. I think I need a little bit more than that. When looking at the cameras, I've seen that they are not so much a deciding factor. You've got just the slightest edge with the iPhone 6 Plus. Performance-wise, I think that they will even out over time. At least I'm hoping that they will even out over time. I did see some interesting things with the benchmarks that contradicted what I thought I was going to see, so that is promising. In terms of the build quality and the design, they are both the same. They're both designed the same. Internally, they look the same. They have the same weak points. So I'm not really worried about, oh, this one's going to bend and this one won't. I think that if the right pressure is applied at the right point in the right circumstance, that they both will bend. The best thing is going to get a rigid case, something that gives you a little bit extra protection so you don't get some flexing. Both of these are nice phones. I think people will be happy with either one. Me personally, I'm ending up going for the iPhone 6 Plus. I was totally gung-ho at one point to get the iPhone 6, but then I fell back in love with the big display and the pixel density and also the battery life. The battery life for me is really the deciding factor. So let me know what you think. Please put your comments in the comment section below. This has been Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. I'd also be really grateful if you'd follow me on Google+. Plus. Check out the link in the description or also click, click right here. When I am not making reviews, I post a lot of things on Google+. I put updates and other things on there. So that's a good place to see what's going on. So this little guy will be going back to the store. I am sorry, little one. If you have any other questions, you can ask them in the comment section below as well. So happy choosing, everyone, and have a good night.